You know what time it is. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your sleep. Now, our salvation is nearer than when we first had faith. The night is almost over and the day is near. So let's get rid of the actions that belong to the darkness and put on the weapons of light. Let's behave as appropriately as people who live in the day, not in partying and getting drunk, not in sleeping around and obscene behavior, not in fighting and obsession. Instead, dress yourself with the Lord. Dress yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't plan to indulge your selfish desires. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, verse 11 says, you know what time it is. You know what time it is. The hour has already come for you to wake up from sleep. Well, one of the really strange things about 2020 is the warping of our sense of the passage of time. Although the Apostle Paul was speaking figuratively about the disciples knowing the time that it was over the last nine months, we literally have not known what time it is. And I don't mean the hour, I mean sometimes we haven't even known what day of the week it is. The Washington Post published an article in September called The Coronavirus Pandemic is Shattering Our Sense of Time. And you may remember during that um, time of quarantine asking what day it is, right? We were quarantined at home and we just couldn't keep up with it. And this article uh, talked about a reporter in Cleveland, here he is, who realized how much trouble we were having um, back in April, knowing the days. And so at first, he, so he came up with a, a little bit that he did where he would announce very dramatically the day of the week, and he would put up a graphic. And at first, this was funny. You know, we, every day he would just dramatically announce it. But, but by May, this skit got a little old, and it, and it wasn't funny anymore. Every day became Blur's Day. Do you remember when we were living in Blur's Day and the running joke became that we used to have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and now we just have day, 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 and day. We had this kind of uh, mental block about the day. We kind of lost our, our landmarks because everything was so mundane and ordinary. And as for me, it feels like time hasn't been moving at all, but strangely, After that quarantine ended, it it feels like time has flown. It really feels like we have been kind of sleepwalking through these last few months. And so what a profound message we have to think about today from this text. You know what time it is. The hour has already come for you to wake up from sleep. And so no matter how disorienting the past year has been, it's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to wake up to the purpose that God has in mind for us. Um, One of my favorites, Scottish theologian William Barclay, described this scripture using the title, The Threat of Time. The Threat of Time. And so the idea is that we tend to be complacent about the passing of time. We can't... uh, seem to handle, get a handle on time passing in our lives. We think that we have all the time in the world, but then we look up and like now it's almost December, time flies. Time gets away from us, and once it's gone, it's gone. And in the grand scheme of our existence, we usually don't pay a lot of time, a lot of attention to how time is passing. That Washington Post article that I was talking about, that article about coronavirus and time, told the story of a man named William Becker and his grandmother. Uh, he said that, that this young man had a FaceTime conversation with his grandmother who was in the hospital. She was actually um, dying from COVID-19 in Nebraska in July. And It turned out that this FaceTime conversation he had with his grandmother was the last one he was able to see with her. But you see, he thought that he had more time. His his Nana, as he called her, had beaten breast cancer, and she'd beaten lung cancer in her 88 years. And they had family members who had reached their hundreds, and so he felt like he had more time with her. 
And he told his Nana, who was in pain but could understand him during this conversation, that, that he couldn't wait to see her at his wedding, which had been postponed because of the virus. When he tried to speak to her again a few days, she was unconscious and she was fading, and so the nurse kind of held that phone up to her side so that he could see her face and so that he could tell her once more that he loved her. He only had a few minutes with her, and this knowledge that this would be the last time that they would see one another was just at the top of his mind. He just thought he had more time. And the Romans text reminds us, you know what time it is. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your sleep. This waking up that Paul talks about is really a call to action. It was a call to action to the Roman church. He was telling them that it was time for them to take some action, to take moral action and spiritual action in view of the time. And he wasn't talking about a specific date, but he was talking to them about a significant moment. And Paul says that their salvation is nearer than when they first became believers, and it was time for them to wake up and to take action. And if you think about it, that makes total sense because every day of our lives that passes, we are one day closer to seeing Jesus either in heaven or when Jesus comes again. And so Paul is warning He's warning his, the followers of Jesus about coming face to face with their Lord and wishing that they had more time. And I think that's such a profound warning for us this day. What an opportunity we have to wake up and to take action, to take action with God, to take action for God in light of this significant moment in time. This Advent message today is about being a people of the light. And, and that seems to take on a heightened importance when there seems to be so much darkness out there. But the problem that we have with the scripture is that we disciples always have trouble staying awake. And the first story that I thought about is the heartbreaking story that you can read in Matthew 26 about Jesus going to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And you may know that story. You may remember that it was just a few hours before Jesus was going to be betrayed and arrested and crucified. And so Jesus goes to the garden to pray, um, to grow, to get close to the Father, to um, pray about um, God's will in Jesus' life. He threw himself on the ground and he prayed that he would have the strength to accomplish God's will in his life, even to face his own death. And so as Jesus prayed, he asked the disciples to stick with him. He asked the disciples to remain back at a distance and pray with him. But you know what they did? They fell asleep. Not only did they fall asleep once, but they fell asleep twice, and then they fell asleep a third time that night. And Jesus woke them up each time. And finally, Jesus said, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Get up. Let us be going. Friends, it, it's time for us to wake up. And the message that I really want you to hear today is, is this good news, the good news that we receive a lot of these wake-up calls in our lives. If we fall asleep, even as many as three times or more, millions of times in our lives do we fall asleep, Jesus wakes us up. And that wake-up call may get louder and louder and more and more insistent. The more that we ignore Jesus' call to come and follow him, you see, God is not going to give up on us. God is going to keep trying to shake us awake throughout our lives harder and harder, trying to continue to get our attention and wake us up. God's grace continues to empower us more and more to live as God's people, to draw nearer and nearer to God's presence. Over the course of our lifetimes, we will have so many wake-up calls, and so we ought to pray for that, and we ought to expect God's presence to wake up. 
looking back I, I, on my own life, I feel like I probably was asleep for at least the thir first 30 years of my life. But I can also see that day by day, the Holy Spirit was kind of steadily awakening me. God's mercy and grace are never ending, but the thing is that our time is short. And so that is why Paul writes this urgent message to the church in Rome and says, wake up. There seems to be so much grief and trauma and stress these days that some days all we really want to do is just pull those covers over our head and stay in bed, go back to sleep and hide. But remember that this scripture is a call to action at a significant moment in time. And we are at a significant moment in time. Advent during a pandemic, that's a significant moment in time. And so during these upcoming four weeks of Advent, there are three ways that I challenge you to, to wake up to the call that God has on your life in particular. And the first thing that I want to encourage you and challenge you to do, the first thing I pray that we might all do, is wake up to the presence of God in our lives. Let's wake up to the presence of God in our lives um, throughout his life, Jesus sought God's presence regularly and earnestly. And, and it's our purpose to do the same, to know and to love our Creator, to enjoy the presence of the Lord. And we do this through a really simple thing, not an easy thing, but it's simple. We do this through spending time with God. We do this through practicing spiritual disciplines, and disciplines are that. They're things that we discipline ourselves to do every day. Now, I talked a little bit about praying your way through Advent, and so I, I really, really encourage you to participate in that. We're going to begin that December 1st. Um, grab the book called Prayer Practices for Disciples, Creating a Life with God, and that's what we'll be working on, creating a life with God. Um, it's free to you. There's a PDF. We'll get you a free print book if you want it, and Every Monday through Friday, you'll receive a new prayer practice to try at home. Maybe some things you have tried before, but mostly these are unique and unusual ways to connect with God. And not only do we ask you to read along, but we ask you to check our Facebook page, to check our website and our YouTube channel, um, because we're going to be posting videos um, of your friends and neighbors and even some of the church staff and to talk about these different practices. This is going to be a terrific way for us to wake up to the presence of God in our lives. It's, it's a great way for us to grow as followers of Jesus. The second thing that I pray that we might wake up to, and this may sound a little bit strange, but I pray that we might wake up to ourselves, that we might wake up to how we are dressed and you may have picked up on some of the language in today's scripture. Paul says, wake up and get going, but he also says, get dressed. If we're going to wake up and get going, we've got to get dressed, and we've got to get dressed properly. And Paul says that we ought to dress ourselves in Christ. We are to clothe ourselves in Christ. And so the image is that we are taking off the old, dirty clothes, and we are putting on some new ones. We are replacing our old ways for new ways. We are replacing some of our vices with virtues. And being clothed in Christ is a metaphor for, a, for Christian discipleship. When we put on Christ, we are becoming like Christ. And here's what Paul says. He says, the night is almost over and the day is near, so let's get rid of the actions that belong to the darkness and put on the weapons of light. Let's behave appropriately as people who live in the day, not in partying and getting drunk, not in sleeping around and obscene behavior, not in fighting and obsession. And while I would really love to skip right over that verse 13, I think that this is an important part of the scripture um, that I need to talk about because I think our outward behavior, the way that we are clothed, can be harmful both to ourselves and to others. 
Now, we don't know for sure, but it seems to me that Paul lists some very specific things and warns the Roman church about some very specific things for a reason. I'm guessing that the Roman church may have been having some problems with these things he lists. And actually, if I'm honest, these things are problems for us today. Drinking and partying and sleeping around and fighting and arguing with one another. These specific vices are, I think we would all admit, these are unhealthy, unhealthy habits and unhealthy behaviors and they can leave us sleepwalking through our lives. And they may even destroy our lives and our relationships. But you can think broader about this scripture too because these vices that Paul lists can also represent any kind of behavior that is self-centered and destructive. We are not clothed in Christ anytime we are excessively self-focused. And so I challenge you this Advent to wake up to, to yourself. I hope you will ask yourself over the next few weeks of Advent, am I going to wake up one day and wish I had lived these, these days differently? And one of the prayer practices that you'll come across in the Pray Your Way Through Advent is the prayer of examine. And I think this is one of the hardest um, prayers that we can pray because it's an examination of our own selves. We're looking inward and being honest about what we see. And so in that prayer practice, we will consider um, how we have done God's will in our lives and how we have not. We will think about how we have loved God and our neighbors and how we have not. We will look at how we are loving ourselves and how we are not loving ourselves. And then we will pray about how we might begin to clothe ourselves in Christ with God's help. And so this Advent, let's examine ourselves and begin to notice where we fail and to ask for God's help to do better. I feel uh, really compelled to emphasize to you that God's forgiveness is always available. And so the deeper work of this process in examining ourselves is being able to receive God's forgiveness, um, to practice loving ourselves, and also being honest about areas where we need help with healing. And so maybe this Advent is a time for some, some honesty with ourselves about the problems in our lives. You know, this is a hard time that we're living in. And I'm going to guess that we're all having problems. So think about your life. Think about areas like stress and anxiety and depression and think about strained relationships, think about um, addictions, financial problems. Are you grieving? And there's no time to waste in leaning on God when we have problems and also in getting professional help when we need it. That's how we grow as disciples. This is how we clothe ourselves in Christ. It is Hard work looking at ourselves, but it is how we become clothed in Christ. So let's wake up to ourselves. The third thing that I bring to your um, attention is let's wake up to the needs of our neighbors. And this one's a little bit different because lately it seems like the pandemic has done a pretty good job of waking us up to the needs of our neighbors. It's almost like this crisis has has shown a light on the needs of our world because on the news we're seeing long lines of people waiting to get food at food pantries. We know the trauma that our medical professionals are experiencing these days. We know people who are sick. We know people who are grieving. We know people who are isolated and lonely. 
And not only that, but in the last few months, we've been awakened to the pain of racial injustice that we've been blind to for a really long time. You know, I got to thinking it's almost like we're, we're so awake about the needs of our neighbors these days that it's become overwhelming, and we feel kind of helpless. But this Advent, I want to challenge you to do, to do this. I want to challenge you to ask God to show you that one person who needs something that we can give. Ask God to show you that one person who needs something that we can give. Are there physical needs we can help with? Are there prayer needs that we can help with? Do we need to make a phone call or write a note? Are there people we might need to invite to worship or invite to um, participate in this pray, through, pray your way through Advent? Are there people who need to know um, this information about prayer? I'm convinced that if we ask God to show us, God will put that person in our pathway. So church, today's, today's message is about waking up to God's purpose for our lives. If the news of God's consistent and persistent and insistent grace is going to be shared, then it is up to us. God intends for us to tell people that the night is almost over and that dawn is about to break. And so my prayer for all of us this Advent is that we might wake up to see exactly how God intends to accomplish that purpose through us. And so before I stop talking today, I want you to hear the scripture one more time. Listen to this word, um, the way the Message Bible paraphrases it. Make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day-to-day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off, oblivious to God. The night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work He began when we first believed. We can't afford to waste a minute We must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence, in sleeping around in dissipation, in bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Get out of bed and get dressed. Don't loiter and linger, waiting until the very last minute. Dress yourselves in Christ and be up and about. God has a purpose for your life, especially during this pandemic moment in time. And that purpose is to love and to be loved. And we can't afford to waste a minute. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.